Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm so happy to uh, be part of this special event today, tonight. Um, the special event because that's the first lecture within our third edition of the A Plus Lectures program. And uh, let me just say, if, oh, my name is, let me introduce myself. My name is Marek Łukasik and I'm Vice Rector for Development and Cooperation at Pomeranian University in Swoopsk. Let me just say a few words about the program itself. So the A Plus Lectures program is part of a wider program, a project that we coordinate at our university, which is called Active University Program. This Active University Program is aimed at big, huge uh, public outreach and university impact amongst society. So these lectures of internationally renowned professionals, experts in their fields, is an important element of that. Um, I have I would like to invite all of you uh, to watch all our previous A plus lectures. They are available on our YouTube channel. Most, some of them, half of them, I think by now, are with the, the Polish subtitles. So I think you will benefit from watching those uh, from those videos, those lectures. And uh, this lecture today will also be in English. And uh, this is this will also come with uh, subtitles at some point this year. Um, the moderator of today's event is Professor Janusz Gierszewski, the director of the Institute of Security and um, Management. And uh, our guest today is a renowned Professor Paweł Neczas. And uh, welcome to this event tonight. Um, we are so happy to host you here. I hope everything's fine. We are having more and more people coming. It's going to be a very interesting lecture. Unfortunately, I will have to leave at some point and I will definitely watch uh, this lecture later if you do not mind. And I invite all of the students, all of the academic staff and obviously uh, the entire public beyond our university to join us anytime you wish, because that's on YouTube channel, and please visit our YouTube channel. One technical or two technical uh, things. Now, the moderator today is Professor Janusz Gierszewski, the director of the Institute, and later towards the uh, end of the lecture, uh, he will uh, coordinate and moderate the question and answer session. Because this platform that we're on now allows uh, asking questions through chat, all questions should go into the chat box that you can see on your right. So there is this chat box and I would kindly ask anyone who is willing to ask a question or comment on the lecture to put their comments in the chat box and send it to everyone else. I would also kindly ask Professor Gierszewski to read out those questions so that all of our listeners and viewers who would just watch us later on through YouTube will be able to also uh, follow the questions because the YouTube stream does not see the questions that appear in the chat box. So that's my kind request tonight. And uh, well, I think that's enough of me now. And I would like, I would give the floor to Professor Gierszewski to introduce our guest tonight. Thank you. And for now, I have to say goodbye. I will then listen to your lecture for a little while, but then I will have to leave. I'm sorry for that. I wish you a great lecture. And please, Professor Gierszewski, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I cordially greet you. Thank you for your free time for this meeting. Um, this is second meeting by the Institute Security of and Management under the program. I would like to thank Professor Marek Łukasik of, um, uh, and his um, team for the opportunity to invite Professor Paweł Nesas. I, um, 
I am asking that the second part, the discussion after the lecture, by let be the deputy for science, Dr. Isa Skurwak. Um, there, Professor Paweł Nesas, um, it was supposed to be a short biography, but it's not. Dr. Honoris Causa, Professor Doma of Engineer, PhD, MBA, Colonel Tide, Paweł Nesas is professor at the Security Studies Department and Vice Dean for Science, Research and Development at the Faculty of Political Science and International Relations, Matthew Bell University in Banska Bystrica. Having held numerous assessments in the first training and education establishments and the research and development branch during his 40th career, and since 1999, he became program manager of the training and simulation system. In the year 2004, he was well selected for the NATO Defense College Research Fellowship Program is a research fellow. His research was focused on political military strategic issue, particularly defense and security policy, international relations, and international security studies. Afterward, he served as a curriculum planning branch chief at the NATO Defense College in Roma, Italy. Having completed the tour, he was appointed to a position of vice-rector for science and the Slovak Armed Forces Academy and Superintendent of Rector of the Academy. The 2013 year, he served as the defense and security advisor at the Slovak permanent representation to the European Union in the Brussels, Belgium. After that, he held the position of rector at the University of Security Management in Kosice. Professor Pablo Nesas received a master's degree in Command Control Communication and Information Systems, a doctorate degree in operational and tactical deployment of the air forces and the air defenses, and professor degree in national and international defense and security. Professor Pablo Nesas is a member of significant scientific and professional institution and committee in Slovakia and in NATO and European Union countries, and is an author of a number of monographs, books, papers, and articles focused on the political science, international relations, and security and defense, published worldwide. I can assure you that there is a very drastic man behind this biography. So let's let him give a lecture to Professor Pavel. Please begin the lecture. The microphone and the screen are at your disposal. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's a really great pleasure for me to having been invited to this uh, important forum, important format for giving my briefing. And my warm welcome goes to Professor uh, Rector Lukashik for uh, the introduction and especially for Professor Yershevsky, who actually introduced me and who actually uh, had, had, the, had the pleasure to, to give you the big picture, actually what I was and what I am now. And once again, a warm welcome to other people which are connected in this session. Uh, Within the next about 45 minutes, uh, I, I will take this floor. As uh, Professor Gershevsky had mentioned, I had the pleasure to serve uh, other NATO uh, structures and of course uh, within the EU structures as the civilian after, after this assignment. So, and of course, I had the pleasure to be rector or vice rector uh, in this, all forms of universities, private, public, and state universities. Uh, so I could compare the advantages and the disadvantages between these three uh, forms of ownership or the forms of, uh, of uh, how, these, uh, how these universities are, are uh, organized and supported by the ministries or by other private companies. Uh, today, 
uh, I will share with you, uh, I hope it's going to be interesting for you. If you have any questions or any, any comments, uh, please feel free after my, my briefing, ask what, what, whatever you want. Once again, I spent majority of my life uh, in uniform. I am the Airman, the Air Force. Uh, I was retired, as uh, Professor Gershevsky mentioned, in the rank of Colonel. So I have three stars on my on my shoulder, but of course retired. I was very short to be a Brigadier General promoted. And I'm very happy to have this uh, chance to spend so many years in the uniform. And after that, actually, I spent my life, uh, of course, in uh, majority of my life, many years uh, serving by, by the NATO, as was already mentioned, by the EU, European Union structures. Uh, so more than 50, more than more than 15 years, I I really shared the other opinions and the other the other, let's say, uh, the air uh, in Brussels and in Mons and in Rome and the other cities. And what I can only recommend you, because I, as I was informed, some of you are the students of your university. I really support this program of internalization. And for my assessment, to be internet, internet, internationalized, it's, it's one of the great challenges which we are facing now. And I really support, I recommend you to, to uh, be engaged in this internet, internet, internationalization process. And of course, uh, during my life, I, I uh, spent or I was engaged in many decision-making processes under the roof of international crisis management. I was a member of uh, a number of bodies dealing with crisis management, international or domestic. Uh, I still work for Ministry of Interna, uh, Interior Affairs. Uh, right now, we are building the concept of interior crisis management system and the concept of protection of a critical infrastructure, which is one part of my briefing. So I will, of course, touch up on this. So, uh, so uh, you bet I understand this issue. And but of course, uh, uh, some of you might um, might uh, be uh, might be interesting in this issue much more uh, while re while being while being preparing their PhD or associate professor. Uh, this is so please feel free. I'm more than happy to help you in this within this stage. Uh, so, uh, what is actually the overview of my next uh, couple of minutes? Uh, first of all, uh, we will uh, I will tell I will try to explain you what is the framework of crisis management. Actually, what it stands for. What are the requirements of the crisis management? what actually the management of uh, how to deal, how to cope with the crisis should consist of. And uh, last but not least, of course, we will, we will mention or I will mention the lessons learned. Uh, the lessons learned is, is, one, is one very, very heavy, uh, important topic or important part of overall management issues. In the final in the final stage, and uh, I can tell you, very, I can tell you very frankly, majority or many of people right now, many of people is stating in a really high positions, they are they are forgetting about this, and they don't use actually these lessons learned, uh, uh, lessons learned um, outputs how to improve the future development of or the future procedures. So this is actually the short overview. Uh, just to put one picture in this, uh, what actually crisis stands for, there is no general uh, agreed definition. Of course, uh, your lecturers or your lecturers, your professors at your university, they might claim, yes, I, I, I found the very, very best, uh, very best uh, definition of the crisis. Of course, that's, that's possible. Uh, I agree with this, but generally, there is a number of school of thoughts. You are familiar with this term, school of thoughts. And then each of these school of thoughts, uh, you bet, uh, has its own its own definition, its own its own uh, uh, understanding. Uh, what is it actually? What it should consist and and uh, what it should stand for. So, 
we, we may we may discuss this is organizational procedures uh, arrangement how to control the crisis or this is national or international where a threat or priority will is interest or goal so it depends definitely uh, what are the crisis characteristics first of all when the crisis appears we are under really time pressure uh, the emerging threat is urgent and of course like Sun Tzu or Sun Tzu, the famous uh, ancient Chinese uh, strategic war theorist, claims in his, in his famous book, uh, Art of War. So he claims that the war is uncertain, of course. And he claims uh, additional other issues, uh, uh, proverbs, which uh, so far are very right now at present. Of course, and normally crisis, is has actually is is increasing the process of crisis crisis in, is increasing by intensity so so of course we are facing the threat the surprise we are under time pressure we must react urgently and there is great around us there is the the environment is uncertain and of course normally the crisis increase its intensity this is actually the famous uh, picture of the crisis, how the crisis uh, develop and how the crisis ends. In this sense, uh, you, you may understand uh, this picture in different ways, by the time, by the level of ex intensive expansion, or by the stress at, on the X layer, or by the performance on the Y layer. So, additional, uh, picture, time and intensity. This is what I focus to. Crisis spectrum. Of course, we start, the crisis starts with the low intensity. And of course, it ends with the low intensity. Normally, we call this end state, crisis end state, this final stage. But what actually is interesting in this, in this middle part is the high, the local extreme of crisis. And we call it also as confrontation, the peak of the crisis, the local extreme and or confrontation. So this is the standard time curve, how the crisis develops, how it, how it starts, how it ends. And of course, by the time the curve raises its intensity, that, that's actually what I claimed in the couple of slides ago. Of course, we have to understand that crisis or trends and challenges of crisis are, are based on some axioms like increasing transnational. The crisis is normally complex, independent. Uh, we must understand uh, the importance of the media Let's take the case of uh, Ukraine right now. How Ukraine is dealing very good with media, and with uh, with the help of media, uh, definitely the management, the crisis management in Ukraine goes in a very right way. Technological technological development, of course, this is uh, we call it on the other way. We call it uh, a revolution in technical affairs uh, uh, as. Uh, as the military, so uh, you are you are faced right now. Around you, there are a brand new technology, technological devices, technological technological tools which had never been used before. Let's uh, let's imagine the drones. How the Turkish drones are effective in if we if we take uh, in in our mind the crisis in Ukraine or the war in Ukraine. So this is actually enormous. The balance between prevention and crisis management. This is a different issue. In this sense, we are speaking about prevention and preemption. Prevention normally means that we have to prevent in order to actually uh, to take the countermeasures in a short, in a middle or long term period to be to, uh, to the crisis not to happen. And this is actually pre prevention. If we speak about preemption, the, the preemptive attack is immediate attack. 
this is an attack or countermeasure which actually should should be taken in effective or in action immediately against the imminent threat or how to cope with imminent threat so this is in brief explanation about preemption and prevention normally standardly we speak about prevention because the crisis normally we we, uh, we act in prevention process to prevent the crisis and we have actually to take great measures great great uh, uh, great uh, other tools uh, from different way like diplomatic military uh, military at the, at the last stage of course but uh, financial social uh, and other uh, we call it instruments of power this is the old american school uh, instruments of power other than military the military is actually on the last on the last stage and of course planning versus flexibility we have to plan and we have to of course be flexible on the other hand so we don't have to stick with the long-term planning and i will be speaking about so-called procedures standard operational procedures sops which which are enormously important in the sense of in the sense of uh, dealing with the crisis crisis management or how to manage the crisis what are the crisis actually objectives or crisis management objectives definitely we need to reduce tensions why of course just to it's very simple just about crisis we have to uh, be sure that the timing uh, is is uh, running not so fast and that, that the time is running not so fast and the timing uh, we is our advantage so we should prepare we should have enough time to have prepared civilian and prepared military of course our armed forces enormous important of course we should actually uh, be effective this is what i mentioned and of course additional point we need to prevent escalation of course i mentioned that normally crises escalate but of course we have to stick with this rule that to decrease escalation the more we decrease escalation of the crisis the best for us and we have to find out how to disease how to persuade the aggressor to stop the attack or to, to diminish the attack uh, and of course to withdraw to end the crisis of course and then we have to think about how to actually de-escalate so-called exit strategy the exit strategy enormous important right now or actually in past as well this is the issue which actually u.s forces uh u.s forces was lacking by iraqi wars by the first and the second gulf wars so uh, the exit strategy enormous enormous important issue on the next slide uh, I, I would like to focus you on additional uh, coordination issues during dealing the crisis we have to share information of course we have to have a really good social network uh, we have to compare our views our different views we have to understand and to take collective action in collective action uh, once again, the case study right now, uh, think about Ukraine, uh, of course, EU, European Union is taking joint actions uh, again against the, aggress against the Russian aggressor. Uh, so uh, this is one of the very crucial issues which we should take in mind. What is actually uh, some words about, some points about uh, organization? Uh, normally, the crisis management organization in, is regulated by law. Uh, of course, each nation, uh, Polish nation, Slovak nation, Ukrainian nation, uh, French nation has its own law. And of course, uh, this crisis management, this law, which, are, which is aimed for the crisis management, the uh, crisis management uh, issues, uh, has some kind of regu regulatory tools, regulatory um, instruments. Uh, definitely, we have to rely on unified chain of command 
chain of command or how to drive, how to control, how to how to command, command and control C2, for example, uh, the, our our uh, our uh, tools or our manpower as well. We don't forget. We mustn't forget on de de democratic democratic control. Democratic control is one uh, again uh, one issue which uh, should not be taken in uh, in uh, a part. We, th this the de democratic control uh, is one of uh, one of uh, one of the issue based on the existence of collaboration within the state. State departments within the state's structure, state state based, uh, or in your language, if you wish, public based organization, uh, including the private sector, including the NGOs, non government organizations. So of course, all this issue, all this all these bodies should be controlled within the crisis management process on the democratic level, democratically. Now we mustn't forget about interministerial cooperation. This is an additional issue. Uh, and of course, we must focus on how to use successful examples from the past, so-called lessons learned, as I mentioned already. And of course, and additional, we should uh, have the detailed procedures and measures to adopt it. Uh, on the other way, we must use what is available we uh, we mustn't rely only during crisis management process only what we think that they, uh, that actually is realistic we should use all these available tools within this whole box uh, normally uh, we call it uh, we may compare it with hybrid warfare you have had about this issue hybrid warfare hybrid warfare actually consists of the warfare generally warfare using all these available means and tools we, therefore we call it hybrid and in this sense we have to use again how do we if we cope with the crisis if we manage the crisis or try at least to manage the crisis we need to use all these tools available we need to use all equipment we need to we need we need to use all available issues which we have and of course, we need to uh, inform the public. And how to inform the public? Public awareness using communication tools. So this is uh, one of uh, the more, uh, more, uh, and I would say one of the cru crucial crisis management organizational principles, uh, which we need to take in our mind. Uh, speaking about machinery, how the crisis machinery uh, looks like. First of all, uh, if we drive the crisis, if we manage the crisis, we need to have very good facilities and very good staff, which we rely on in addition to this manpower. Okay, to this manpower, we need to have some kind of procedures, arrangements, we call it SOPs, standard operational procedures. If uh, we don't have this, it's it's a fault. I just recall your attention uh, a little bit backwards, two years ago, when uh, anything new, absolutely so-called COVID, uh, had appeared, and now the crisis, the people on the different public or the, the different uh, uh, private levels, they just they just uh, they just uh, revealed that they do not have any plans how to cope with COVID at the time. They were missing absolutely so-called these standard operational procedures. So in this sense, we must have the very good, the very good manuals with standard operational procedures. It means in these manuals, we need to know what is the step one, what is the step two, step three, step four, and what is the final step. And of course, in these steps, we need to know what uh, what each step stands for. What is actually is it created for? 
what are the measures what are actually the uh, what are the, the tools what are actually the the, uh, the the other assets which are linked with these steps so these are standard operational procedures in in, in my uh, when i when i was in uniform uh, we had to have these sops uh, prepared for every every unstandard situation let's uh, we let's call let's call it as a crisis situation and uh, and for the air force it was normal this was actually not and still it's not the case for the civilian civilian uh, public uh, civilian public organizations so don't forget about this uh, communication communication is uh, enormous crucial in a sense it must be really fast reliable not redundant uh, must be in time and of course we have to convey some decisions in this sense we speak about operational centers and situation centers so-called sit sense and op sense situation center is actually the center which uh, which aggregate all this information and then make some uh, some output for decision makers so opsen from opsen it goes to sit uh, sorry for sit from sit sen situation center it goes to opsen at operational center there are the decision makers but they need to have some inputs from the analysts from the intelligence guys which actually are part of the sitsen situation center in brussels there are sitsens of course and opsens for the eu and as well for the nato these uh, on uh, on the level of ministries ministries of uh, ministry of defense ministry of interior affairs ministry of foreign affairs and of course ministry of finance uh, all these ministries uh, in case of uh, my country they of course uh, run regulate uh, their own citizens and options of course which are linked and this should actually put much more much more uh, impact much more importance for the overall crisis management process. Uh, very, very concretely, what I actually mentioned, all these centers are working 7, 7 24, 7. It means 24 hours uh, in uh, every day, 24 hours. So this is an continuous process. The service should be running uncontinuously. And of course, uh this uh, opsen and sitsen should work very closely and should be should be uh capable to convey any informants uh, any info, uh, any uh, important decision for the great decision makers for the head of states for the ministers for other people dealing with the crisis management If we speak about how it, how how actually the process in this opsense and sitsen rouse uh, runs, uh, first of all, there should be some kind of identification and monitoring. The sitsen situation center monitor situation twenty four seven, and then just issue information to the opsen, and the opsen is producing some kind of guidance or decisions, if you wish, for the decision makers on the higher or highest level so in this case we are speaking about intel guys intelligence and decision makers um, in the sense of nato i used to work there as well a couple of years if we speak about uh, nato intelligence warning system so-called niws this is an enormous part of NATO NATO uh, this NATO structure decision structure which uh, issues a strategic warning what does it mean strategic warning it means warning on strategic level and of course this is actually this is a part of an important NATO crisis management process we used to teach NATO uh, NATO crisis management process at our university uh, this is not a simple process 
the crisis mission process uh, in NATO uh, takes a number of steps. Uh, when I worked for uh, NATO Defense College in Rome, in Italy, the highest NATO educational institution, uh, we organized uh, we organized the exercises. So one of the exercise, so-called NMDX, NATO uh, Mediation and Negotiation Exercises. Uh, good exercises, good good uh, good example, good uh, uh, good time for the students and for the diplomats, for generals. Of course, uh, this system actually uh, is a part of alliance system and puts all this information throughout alliance. And of course, should deliver qualitative for looking assessments. This is important, assessment. If, if, you, if you are going to work for NATO or in EU or for EU in, in future, uh, the assessment is uh, very, very normally a normally co copied word, a normally used word, assessment and decision as well. Um, in addition to this, in NATO, of course, if we speak about operational center, we uh, we have to speak also about crisis response system, NCRS. Crisis response system. It's uh, it's it's a very comprehensive system which which actually roofs all these other pi pillars uh, of the other of the other uh, and the other tools which are available. Uh, of course, this is a part of the wide NATO crisis management process, and it's clear uh, it's link is linked closely to the N N NIWS operational procedures and civil emergency planning arrangements. All the systems are actually as a component. They are adjacent. Um, what about if we speak about preventive options, which are being used in the NCRS? Definitely. We, once again, I can just repeat what I mentioned, the other operational principles during the first uh, slides. We you have to have the very good uh, use of media, uh, intel, guys, intelligence and counterintelligence, warnings. We need to know, know. We need to use the economic tools, the economic packages. Uh, case study right now: Ukraine against Russia. Economic packages against Russia, which are adopted by the EU or actually European Parliament, uh, proposed by European Commission as well. So we need to train. We need to exercise. Uh, in my in my opinion, uh, the people are absolutely or were not absolutely prepared for exercising. Uh, in my in my practical in my practice uh, a couple of years ago, when we used to organize the huge trainings, the huge exercises for the people of state and public departments, they didn't know actually, actually what they are supposed to do. And of course, uh, we need to we need to uh, we need to think about some kind of actions to support certain states, as the EU supports Ukraine, for Ukraine, for example. Uh, what are actually the CRM subject areas? You can just read it. First, I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, you have the, my briefing, so you can just. It's going to be shared. So, uh, so again, the, on this alphabetic order, you you may witness how many how many uh, how many areas or areas of interest as you wish we've been using. So again, once one of uh, important issue. Uh, excuse me. Okay. And the question now, how to each achieve all this objective running to effectively control, command the crisis? Definitely, we need to have adoption of contextual challenges. We need to have adjustments of strategy, okay? For example, in very concrete, uh, concrete uh, arrangements, uh, we should definitely rely much more on NATO EU cooperation. Uh, since a couple of years, we are speaking about how to harmonize NATO and EU. 
uh, in my life, I witnessed, uh, I was a member of uh, EU, NATO, uh, EU NATO capabilities group, uh, for example, uh, when, uh, when we discussed hours and hours the issues uh, dealing with the Cyprus and the Turks, uh, the Turkish uh, dipl diplomats or military guys and the Greek, uh, on the other hand, they had some problems to understand each other in the sense of how to deal with this issue on the common joint platform, EU-NATO, about Cyprus. So definitely we should improve this sense, we should improve this, uh, this relation. Uh, about the European Security Committee uh, put a part into NATO structure. This is a, this is a question of institutionalization, uh, of actually is already done and is supposed to be done. And of course, we have to create some kind of coalitions of the willing. Uh, there are absolutely only benefits from this. Uh, speaking about, about uh, defense structures, uh, in the majority, uh, in number of states, uh, if speaking about the 30 states, 30 NATO members, uh, of course, uh, generally, uh, the armed forces are full profession. And, and we, of course, are, uh, we have to put focus on the EU battle groups, which is still the issue, uh, not very much, uh, uh, not very much uh, supported by the EU, EU, uh, uh, EU headquarters or EU, EU leaders. Then, of course, we should keep the NATO structure, uh, NATO pillar, uh, as as a part within the EU. So there are there are many. There are, there are many areas between EU and NATO how we should actually cooperate much more. Uh, financing. Financing is uh, very important. Uh, we, uh, the, the quest for uh, defense funds, uh, defense support, defense fund, defense uh, funds up to our defense military budget uh, above 2% of GNP, gross domestic or GDP, gross domestic, gross national product, gross domestic product. Uh, we call for this. Uh, this is not the case of uh, my country, for example. We are still running 1.6. Uh, it was promised to, run, to go by 1.8. Your country is doing much better in this sense. Uh, and of course, we need to understand that uh, security is not cheap now, especially now in the in the case of uh, of uh, Ukrainian or, uh, war or actually Russian aggression in Ukraine. These are technical technical issues which uh, you may focus later on in discussion or or, or in other readings. Uh, maybe I can share. Uh, I will during discussion or after or after this lecture, I can give you a link to my to my monograph when I explained all these uh, all these proposals how to improve, uh, for example, NATO decision making process. You may have heard about. Uh, about uh, some problems uh, with one member state of NATO, which is not very much willing to to agree with uh, the expansion of NATO for the two new members, uh, two new members from North, uh, which actually claimed interest to become a member or actually applied for the membership, NATO membership, and uh, this particular state uh, is not very much interested in this and is not very much impressed. So again, this is the example how we could improve the decision making process. Preemption, definitely preemption. Uh, this is an issue. Right now, everyone actually wants to prevent. Prevent is uh, is not cheap, but uh, but it's not so it's not so hard to do. We, of course, you may have heard about hard power, soft power within the crisis management area. How to how to actually if. The, the question is whether we should use NATO for the hard power, whether we should use EU the dealing with the crisis for the for actually the uh, the soft power. So so again, this is the issue what we should uh, not forget. Uh, this concept I will skip this slides uh, NATO response force concept. This is pretty technical form, and of course, combination warfare. Uh, some some someone calls it as combination warfare. Someone calls it as as uh, hybrid warfare. It's as you wish. Uh, so these are actually uh, some some proposals. 
If we speak about crisis management, security environment, uh, strategic vision right now, uh, of course, uh, the question of European Union Green Deal, this is ambitions agenda right now, including this Green Deal. We are speaking about the grass, we are, we are speaking about, we are, we are lacking the gas, we are looking for to, to find some other, some, some other pipelines uh, which are bringing us more gas uh, from, uh, not only for, from Russia, but from the other countries. Uh, of course, but we actually hit uh, the barrier, so-called EU Green Deal. Uh, and and I personally, I don't think that the, the issue is so easy to be, uh, to be understood or to be actually resolved within uh, a couple, within short term period. Of course, we should adopt new military strategic st strategies. Uh, and definitely, we should go from the top mission, purpose, and then strategies. Uh, I, I mentioned how we should deal with media a number of times. I will not uh, go into the details because time is running so fast. Uh, media is and social media uh, enormously important. Social network uh, at present, um, enormous power. Uh, we are a member of a uh, project, uh, European project dealing with uh, dealing with uh, information uh, misuse and dealing with uh, with uh, actually the fakes on the social networks uh, how they how these uh, misuse or these fakes uh, how they actually influence uh, influence the public opinion uh, and a very important project funded by EU commission so i would recommend you to read some uh, some other some of our uh, conclusions. Uh, these are the communications goals, which uh, are actually adjacent to how to handle with media. Of course, um, we should balance uh, between the issues of reassurance and alarm. We should build. Uh, we should uh, come up with consensus, and of course, coming to actually uh, one other important issue. What are the steps of pre-crisis planning? First of all, we need to analyze object. We should adopt risk analysis. We should understand how it is organized, how the information flow from, from, uh, from the start to the end. Uh, we should understand the decision-making support system. And once again, and I mentioned a couple of times, train, 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 and exercise, and exercise, and exercise. Uh, what are the decision maker, decision maker uh, requirements? Use in full form the sitsen and opsen. These two centers are of great are of a great crucial. Be time, be timely, be, be usable, and be resources oriented. Uh, each decision maker should be, and this is actually not the rule. Uh, what is actually uh, at present by this is just what they uh, how they actually should look like or what actually capabilities uh, each decision maker should have it should be informed available practicized interactive resolute prudent sustainable decisive <laughs> and normally i don't read the slides but in this sense uh, i do exception uh, coming to the lessons learned what are the lessons learned? Uh, definitely engage early where when the crisis when the crisis uh, evoke or uh, is uh, being opened, we should engage early. We need to put emphasis on prevention and of course on preemption, as I said already. Uh, we should uh, we should uh, adopt the overall approach combined, the Americans, they call it combined approach, combined approach. And of course, we need to be coordinated. Uh, when I when I used to work in NATO, we had some, so, some sometimes pro problem with the Intel guys uh, because we asked for some uh, classified informations from one nation. And, and unfortunately, this nation was not willing. It was a NATO member nation. It was not willing to pass this uh, classified information to us. And uh, so, so therefore, uh, uh, this uh, coronation is uh, much uh, is is important is 
uh, is uh, should really uh, there should be really a great emphasis put on this. Uh, we, we we are used to say need to know, need to share, and ready to share. And this is actually the question uh, we need to know. We need to share, but if we are, the question is whether we are really uh, ready to share. We are ready, and but but on the other side, they must not be. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they don't have to be actually. They don't then they don't have to be willing to share this information with us. So this is uh, this might be a problem. Of course, mission mandate and capabilities uh, solving the crisis. Uh, at present, uh, this, was, this was not the case uh, for a long time, but, but in the past, uh, we had to harmonize civil and military planning and we had to coordinate civil and military actions. Uh, this was not the case in the past. Uh, these, uh, these activities uh, uh, normally was, uh, was running apart was not uh, coordinated, was not con controlled, but the situation has, has improved or is being improving so far. And that I can, I can tell you that, uh, that right now the, the coordination between civil, 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 for example, right now the, 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 the notion of civil operation is, uh, is absolutely standard. A couple of years ago, if you said civil operation, well, hey, what is it for? What, is, what does it stand for? What does it stand for? And of course, use the, the overall toolbox, crisis management toolbox. Use all these available tools, how to cope, how to deal with crisis. Uh, once again, we used to say that um, uh, let's come back one year, uh, one year back when uh, there was no war in Ukraine. There was there were some, uh, some local uh, conflicts around us, around the world. So, and the military defense budget uh, was actually in some countries, even a member states of NATO was decreasing. And the politicians, they claimed we don't need to, uh, to have a really great armed forces. We don't need to have the great military because, because we are on diplomatic, uh, we can handle each with other by diplomatic, by economic, by financial, by, by social tools, by informational tools. We don't need military tools. Why? And now you see how the situation has radically changed. Now everybody is uh, is raising their military budgets. Everybody is putting the arms to help Ukrainians uh, to fight against uh, Russian uh, aggressors. Uh, and you see right now you are witnessing how actually the capabilities uh, within the NATO and within the EU countries are uh, are very much focused on. So this is this was not the case one year one year ago. The situation had, had radically changed and is still being changing. Of course, end state, end state. We uh, we we uh, we should be discussing uh, the problematics of end state. Uh, numbers of hours. Uh, this was actually this was the 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 great issue for the Americans, as I said already. General Schwarzkopf. Uh, you may you may remember General General Schwarzkopf, uh, who actually beat in the Gulf War, uh, and who uh, who was a hero in this sense. So and he actually won militarily, but he did not won politically, because there was no end state in that sense. And the country, uh, this after after action uh, rebuilding of the country, uh, was uh, the Americans they didn't know how how to how to how to deal with this process, how to, how to build, for example, SSR, security sector reform, how to actually handle with this. So this is one, this is really a good, good point, and we should, con we should focus on this point. Of course, post-conflict, post-conflict resolution, it, this is linked to what I already man mentioned. The post-conflict reconstruction term, widely used, and widely, widely spoiled. Uh, I'm not going to tell you any case study. There are there's a number of case studies which you may which you may find, but uh, how how the country failed with the post conflict reconstruction or post conflict resolution, uh, building social security uh, security sector reform. Uh, so this is. These are actually the points which, uh, in the crisis management, we still are looking to find some better options, some better solutions. 
forces. Again, we call for sustainable, deployable and sustainable forces. Deployable, the forces are being moved from point A, A to point B and to sustain, they must be sustainable to sustain for at least 14 days or maybe longer. It depends on the situation. Of course, rules of engagements. Uh, ROV, this is an acronym. If you work for NATO or EU, or if in the future, if there are any students here uh, at this forum and they, they are thinking uh, to, to, to ask uh, at the vacancies uh, for the NATO or EU structures, you will, you will have to learn in, the, in that sense uh, the whole vocabulary of NATO and EU acronyms. One of these is ROEs, rules of engagement. Again, issue, technical issue, a very, a very difficult issue and very important issue in the crisis management toolbox. How to settle this? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time for, for more explanation on this, but uh, of course we need to win in the sense if we put any forces, like, uh, like for example, within the EU operation, uh, peace, uh, peacemaking, or let's say concretely peace enforcement. So, so, uh, so I will just, and I will come to the end, of course, uh, and thank you very much, uh, dear Professor, uh, dear Professor Janusz uh, Gershewski. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, actually, this is this is uh, almost all what I wanted to tell you, and you have the briefing. I think I just uh, I stepped a couple of minutes over uh, over this promised 45 minutes, so I'm sorry about this, uh, but I did I tried to do my, did my best. Thank you very much. If you if you have any questions or uh, please feel free. Uh, dear professor, thank you for your interesting lecture. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? If you wish, meanwhile, if you wish, I can send you the link or I can send you the PDF form of, uh, of my of my recent monographs. I will I will send it to to uh, to my colleagues uh, uh, in this session to to Miss uh, Miss Isabella and and then she may uh, she she might share this uh, in PDF format with you if you are really interested in these issues. Or maybe we can share my emails uh, and then we can discuss these issues. As I said, I am focused on uh, not only on crisis management, but I can give you some advices within the NATO structures, EU structures, and within the security business, security and defense businesses. Okay? Because right now the crisis management is very linked to all these all these points: security, uh, defense, crisis management, or crisis as such. All these all these. Uh, Items are very close links linked. Dear Professor, we have one question, but you mm -hmm. give me one minute, please. Okay, you can write it. Mm -hmm. Because the students wrote this uh, question. No problem at all. Uh, maybe I can. I can. I'm really wondering uh, while I mentioned uh, this crisis management decision making process. Which is right now running uh, because because we could consider this as a, as as a decision making process of NATO accession for these two uh, two Nordic countries uh, because uh, they consider the situation now as the crisis situation. So and the crisis should actually should evolve in future or should should expand in future. So th therefore, these two countries they are asking they are calling to have much more security. Uh, security guarantees, and uh, I really am wondering uh, if this one NATO or a NATO nation, which is reluctant to adopt these two countries, uh, how actually the the voting actually there is no voting system in NATO. Uh, there is there is the decision system of unanimity. Everyone everybody must agree. So I'm really wondering how this decision making process should end. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have one question about NATO concepts of crisis management. Mm -hmm. uh, should we build some structure or an inter introduction for crisis management for you is on in operation sense with uh, take some responsibility over the country's members? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh... Okay, and if we should build some structure or, or institution for crisis management for EU zone in operational sense, which takes some responsibility over the countries, EU countries, EU member states, you mean? So normally we use member, EU member states. Uh, yes, uh, I used to work for EU five years almost. So uh, maybe I mentioned it in my briefing, maybe not. There is already in Brussels, in uh, very close to Schumann Square, where the EU Commission is located. There, there is the military building, the huge military buildings, actually the huge buildings, uh, the, where the European military staff uh, has their offices. And of course, there is a citizen. And uh, at present, when I was there in 2013, uh, from 2013 up to 2018, it was not yet. Uh, now it should be, it should be, uh, it should be okay, uh, already, uh, already in, in effect, in effective manner, uh, this option. So to answer your question, yes, uh, it should be. But there is already, there was already an option. Uh, there was already citizen, excuse me. And now there is also option. So uh, these two situation of operational center are actually are capable, are if are ineffective, uh, are are dealing with crisis. They have their own standard operational procedures. They, they should actually run the crisis. They should they should command and control the crisis. The uh, for uh, for every every or for each EU member state. The question is, of course, this is the uh, because in EU uh, uh, the membership in EU NATO countries is based on voluntarity. So uh, the question is whether every country, uh, every member state, uh, every member state. Uh, country actually is following this recommendation or this orders from uh, from uh, uh, from this uh, crisis management center uh, dealing with crisis in brussels in close to schumann so yes there is already there is already one body as in nato there is already eu crisis management process uh, or concept of if you call it concept of crisis management there is already it's not the same as in NATO. It's a little bit different. The NATO crisis management concept consists of seven, sometimes eight steps. EU uh, crisis management concept consists of 10, uh, 10 or 12 steps. It depends on the level of operation and mission. So there is already, there is citizen and option, which issue the directives, uh, the directives, the guidance to the, to the heads of the states. And when there is, uh, uh, EU summit, so called, uh, these heads should adopt it. The question is whether they adopt it or not, because it, they are mem mem member states of the European Union. This is not NATO. In NATO, it works much more, much more in a command control way or manner. I, I guess I understood. Uh, I, I, I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? We haven't more questions, I think. Thank you for answer. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. But once again, if if the member states does not adopt the guidance from the crisis management uh, center, if you if you wish to call it in, in Brussels, nothing happens. There are no sanctions. This is voluntary. We have a next question. Mm -hmm. Which solution I gently need to be implemented to the crisis management of UAE countries in relation to the current geopolitical situation? You mean current geopolitical situation around the world or in a, in a Russia-Ukraine conflict? Conflict 
precisely. You are speaking generally, overall, about the whole geopolitical situation. Mr. Joseph. So, meanwhile, then you write it. I, I, I can tell you, uh, speaking, uh, dealing with the case study uh, of, of Ukraine, of Ukraine and Russia, uh, even I was, even I'm retired uh, military man, uh, retired airman, exactly. So, so I would call for much more, much more exploitation of other instruments of power, not only militarily. When I read that, actually, uh, the recent, like as yesterday, uh, the head of EU Commission decided to to put uh, to buy and to put much more arms, armament, uh, heavy tanks, uh, anti-air missiles, and other stuff. Uh, maybe uh, aircrafts, uh, uh, supersonic aircrafts, uh, fighters to to the Ukrainians. I don't think right now it's really the best solution within the EU crisis management EU countries. Uh, I would I would call much more for, as I mentioned in my briefing, to use the other the other tools of, from the toolbox, uh, diplomatic. Uh, we use some kind of economic tools, of course, by the sanctions. But you see the sanctions. Uh, let's speak about the car production industry, the Skoda car, Czech, Czech uh, or Czechoslovakian past, Czech uh, great uh, producer with, withdrew, uh, Renault, the French withdrew from Russia. The Chinese adopted it immediately. The Chinese replaced this car production. So in this sense, uh, the sanctions was counterproductive. Uh, the, the France and the Czech will lose their, the people will lose the, dop, the jobs and so on. So uh, very, very briefly, uh, in this sense, I would use much more uh, soft power uh, dealing with uh, against Russia. Uh, on the other hand, if you speak about current geopolitical situation of all these uh, of these EU member countries, uh, I, I, I'm not, the crisis management. I'm not very uh, con consist of the the the, the jointness or unanimity uh, of uh, the EU member states. Uh, I, I really had the chance to work there, so I witnessed uh, many many negotiations and others. And I can tell you there is still difference between the old countries, old EU countries, and new EU uh, member states, uh, correctly, member states. Uh, so so um, the crisis management uh, should be much more based on, so, on jointly, on a really, uh, uh, really uh, to, to keep actually the same status for all the countries. And of course, it must be much more directive based. Right now, as I mentioned already in the answer for the first question, we are just we are just uh, dealing with uh, the with the soft uh, soft power and with the independent the decision of each head head of the states of the member state. So when the EU actually uh, pr pr produce a decision within the crisis management, security and defense business crisis management, so called, in the sense uh, the member states may adopt it or must not adopt, uh, or may not adopt it as well so uh, so that there are no actual obligations to adopt it which which is again which is again not a good thing for the future development so actually i think uh, i answered your question if not just let me know please ladies and gentlemen do you have more questions I think that's all. Okay, so thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me to share this floor with you, and I hope you will visit our university sometimes. I mean, the students uh, and 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 your staff as well. Under underneath the Erasmus Erasmus framework, we are free. We we signed the agreement with your university already, so so you may use this occasion and to come up to our university. Uh, and we, I, I guess we will do it by uh, vice versa, vice versa. So. Uh, 
Dear Professor, once again, thank you for an interesting lecture. Uh, nice to see you, nice to meet you. Um, crisis management is a very important subject for us, for many people and for uh, uh, people on, on the world. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor. Thank you for your time. Um, have a nice night. Thank you very much. It was nice being with you. Enjoy the